Hey there, interwebs, and welcome back to How Fascinating. I'd say welcome to the final episode of How Fascinating, but that would be a lie. This is episode number 52, meaning I've released an episode every Wednesday for the past 52 weeks. That's a whole year of How Fascinating, making it my longest-running regular series by far. It's been fun, but it's also been a lot of work, work which I'm doing for free, and I have other things I'd like to do with my free time. That's why this will be the final regularly scheduled episode of How Fascinating, but don't worry, I'll still be sporadically releasing episodes in the future whenever it sparks my creative interest. Going forward, however, I'll be working on other projects, including new videos, so you can look forward to fresh installments of flag shaming and assorted fantasy. Now, on to the episode. As you hopefully know, most species will adapt over time to better suit their environment, but humans are one of the few species which adapt their environment to better suit them. See also Canada's state fish, the beaver. Humans are certainly the species which makes these changes to the most extreme degree, and when we change the environment, it also changes the other inhabitants. Sometimes they come together in combined forces, and I'm not talking about how Widener students must regularly do battle with a Voltron made of buff squirrels who long ago forgot all memory of such quaint concepts as fear and mercy. I'm talking about animal hybrids. You've probably heard of domestic hybrids like mules and zoe, and panthera hybrids like ligers, tigons, and leo jaguipards, but I'm not interested in those today. This episode is all about hybrids which occur in the wild. Hybrids like koi wolves. That's koi wolves one word, not koi wolves that feign shyness or modesty to create a sense of allure. They are, as the name indicates, hybrids of coyotes and wolves, and genetically speaking, such a hybrid is fairly easy to achieve. All species of the Canis genus have the same number of chromosomes, 78 for those curious, and this means they can all interbreed and produce fertile offspring. What's more, coyotes, or Canis latrons, are the closest living relatives to the gray wolf Canis lupus, not counting domesticated gray wolves known as Canis lupus familiaris, aka doggos. Koi wolves fall between their two parent species when it comes to both size and behavior, and even their vocalizations combine elements of the two. Executive Director of the Wildlife Science Center, Peggy Callahan, states that their howls begin much like those of regular gray wolves with a deep, strong vocalization, but change partway through into a coyote-like, high-pitched yipping. The most populous type of koi wolf, and the one with the largest range, is known as the Eastern Coyote, and they've got a fascinating secret in their genetics. They're actually four species in one. Meta-analysis of 25 genetic studies of eastern coyotes found that they're about 60-64% to 64 coyote, 26-30% to 30 eastern gray wolf and or western great plains gray wolf, and about 10% dog. Yes, you heard that right. Apparently some feral dogs have contributed their alleles to the eastern coyote gene pool. Speaking of, if you're into cryptids, then you've probably heard of the chupacabra. Many sightings have been reported over the years, and inevitably they almost always turn out to be coyotes or dogs with mange. That being said, a preserved specimen of one collected in 2007 was genetically analyzed, and although initial testing by Texas State University determined that it was merely a coyote, further analysis of its mitochondrial DNA showed that it was actually a koi wolf, fathered by a Mexican wolf. At the other end of North America, you may encounter a hybrid of a grizzly and a polar bear. I choose to call it a growler bear. The convention when naming hybrids with portmanteaus is to use the father's species first, making a polar-sired hybrid a pizzly bear, but pizzle is an Old English word for penis, and in heraldry a bear pizzled gules, for example, would have an obvious red rocket, and this almost started a war one time. If this is all too silly for your tastes, you could also call it a nanulok, which comes from the Inuit names for a polar bear, nanuk, and a grizzly bear, aklak. And before you ask, yes, about half the hybrid animals in this video have at least one name that's just a portmanteau of the parents. Although growler bears have been found in the wild, bred without direct human intervention, they are very rare. Only eight of these wild mixes have ever been found and genetically profiled, and the results show that they're all closely related. One female polar bear, let's call her Eve, had four 50-50 cubs with two different male grizzlies, whom I will call Adam and Steve. One of these four cubs went on to have four second-generation mixes of her own, one with her biological father Adam, and three with Steve. This means all genetically confirmed wild growler bears descend from two grizzlies and Eve, who's the mother of all four growler bears and grandmother of all four quarter growlers. How did this happen, you may wonder? Maybe it's a result of climate change putting pressure on northern species to adapt, with receding ice driving polar bears onto terra firma, combined with warmer temperatures allowing grizzlies to venture further north. Or maybe it's just what comes of one slightly strange polar bear and her slightly strange daughter. Even rarer is the wolfin, and although its name would imply that it's a hybrid of a whale and a dolphin, it's actually a cross between a female bottlenose dolphin and a male false killer whale. Additionally, fun fact, true killer whales, better known as orcas, aren't actually whales, they're oceanic dolphins. They're also one of only three natural predators of adult moose in North America. In case you're wondering how, they go after the moose when they go swimming to forage for aquatic vegetation. Also lurking in the ocean are black tip sharks of both the common and Australian species, and yes, they've successfully crossbred in the wild. 
both first-generation and back-crossed individuals have been discovered along Australia's east coast, making this the first and so far only confirmed case of hybridization among sharks and other cartilaginous fishes. It's an exciting discovery, true, but hybridization isn't necessarily a good thing. Siamese crocodiles and saltwater crocs have been successfully crossbred in captivity, and since Siamese crocs' distribution is completely overlapped by the salties, it's quite probable that these hybrids have occurred in the wild as well. Meanwhile, on the other side of the planet, American crocodiles have been crossbreeding with their Cuban cousins so prevalently that it's becoming a threat to the latter species' genetic integrity, and the same problem exists for captive-bred Siamese saltwater crosses. I recognize that this is a serious conservation issue, but there's no way to use a phrase like genetic integrity without sounding like a Lovecraft great racist concerned about interracial marriage. Presumably, after these hybrid eggs hatch, the baby crocodiles will make their way down the beach and go live forever among the deep ones in their sunken cities. Speaking of reptiles, yellow-bellied sliders and red-eared sliders are popular turtles to keep as pets. Since both are subspecies of pond slider, they are capable of interbreeding, and the hybrid offspring of a yellow-bellied slider and a red-eared slider is, rather uncreatively, known as a yellow-eared slider. The yellow-bellied slider's natural habitat stretches across the American southeast, and although the red-eared slider's habitat exists further west, the two areas do overlap in much of Alabama. The resultant offspring have orange spots on the sides of their heads and can live in excess of 30 years. Such a lifespan is roughly typical for both parent species, but oddly yellow sliders live longer in captivity while red sliders live longer in the wild. Lastly, there is the swoos. If this hybrid of a swan and a goose were created in captivity, I would assume it was an attempt to create the world's most hate-filled bird, but such is not the case. It turns out that swans and geese occasionally just do it on their own in nature. If this behavior continues, we may end up with some sort of spiteful waterfowl uprising on our hands, but if that day should ever come, I am prepared to fight a goose. Until that time, however, thanks for watching, and have a fascinating day.